I'm going to ask if, if we could extend the scripture reading this morning, begin in verse 1 of chapter 3, if that's a possibility, and uh, read through verse 21. So if we can, read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, and you can let me know when you think you're ready to, to display that, okay. All right, well, we're going to back up then to the beginning of John 3 and just read through our text. We're going to be looking specifically this morning at verses 14 through 17. This is what um, John, the Apostle John, the Gospel writer, writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, remembering that this is the Word of God, even though they are thoughts that he wrote down. He was guided by the Spirit to write these things, as well as being an eyewitness testimony to our Lord Jesus Christ, what he said and what he did. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpents in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Again, our, our text this morning is focusing on verses 14 through 17. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. May he grant that we would hear, that we would listen, that we would understand, that we would respond as the Lord would have us to respond. Now again, we've seen so far in John chapter 3 that Jesus says that you need a second birth even to see the kingdom of heaven, even to, uh, not to know that it exists because anybody can read the Bible and know that it exists, but to see it in such a way that you would desire to enter into it, that is to see it in all of its glory, in all of its beauty, something as we've seen those who are in the darkness cannot do because they hate the light and don't want to come to the light. The Spirit of God needs to open your eyes to see the beauty of the kingdom of heaven. And unless you see that beauty, you will never enter it because you're never going to want to enter it. 
Now Jesus said to Nicodemus, your first birth brought you into the world, Nicodemus. It brought you into the line of Abraham, but that's not enough. That's not enough to save you. It's not enough to save you and me any more than it was able to save Nicodemus. It's not enough to be in Abraham's line. It's not enough to be a Jew. It's not enough to be born into the world. The Bible doesn't teach that everyone's going to be saved because they're a part of the human race. You have to be born again. Jesus says you must have a spiritual rebirth, a change of hearts, a spiritual resurrection. You're born dead in trespass and sin. You need to be raised again to life. You need to have that change that changes the whole direction of your life because your heart has changed. Now Jesus said the second birth is the only thing that can open your eyes to see that beauty and to desire it and so trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in order that you may have it. Now again, as I've said, you can believe these things exist apart from the work of the Spirit of God. But you're never going to want it strongly enough to pay the price Jesus calls you to pay unless he shows you just how precious it is. But now again, let's not forget what else Jesus said about this new birth. He said it's something that the Spirit of God gives. And only the Spirit of God can give it. And the Spirit of God will only give it where and when he wills usually under the preaching of the gospel. Basically, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, and he says to you and me this morning, you have no control over this birth. You cannot make it happen by any means, certainly not by praying the sinner's prayer. You need God to give it to you because only he can. You need to ask God in his mercy to give it to you if you don't have it. And since, of course, you don't know where or when the Spirit of God may give it to you, it's if you don't have it, it's not something that you can afford to put off to the end of your life. For one thing, you don't know when that end is going to come, and you don't know whether you're going to have time to get ready for it. You need to seek it now if you don't have it. Ask God in His mercy to give it to you. Now, we also saw from John chapter 3 that you should listen to what Jesus says because He's the only one who has come down from heaven with, you might say, the authoritative word on the subject. Jesus became one with you so that he could explain these things to you in your language. And we saw that he made it as simple as he possibly could, using images that you are familiar with to describe the things that you are not familiar with. Basically, it's the same message Jesus was preaching through his prophets in the Old Testament as he worked through them to give his word. He told the Jews they needed to circumcise their hearts. That's basically this spiritual rebirth in Old Testament terms. But God knew that they couldn't do it, so he promised that he would do it in the gospel. That's what he was showing to Ezekiel, remember, in that vision of the valley of dry bones. The bones did not will themselves to come together and to will flesh upon them and to will the breath of life to enter into them. That's something God said that he was going to do. So what Jesus was speaking about to Nicodemus was not something that was new. It is the only way that anyone has ever been able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's the only way that you can enter into the kingdom you need to be born again. But now this morning, Jesus goes on to tell Nicodemus why God can give this new birth and how you can know that you have it. He can give it because God so loved the world that he gave his son to die on a cross. And you can know that you have it when you believe in the name of Jesus Christ and you receive him as your Lord and your Savior. Now what I'd like us to do is consider both of these things this morning. We're going to particularly emphasize the first point and this evening uh, a bit more on the second point. Now first of all, why can God give this new birth? Why is it even possible for sinners who have entirely fallen away from God, who sinned in Adam, who came into this world hating God, in darkness, who hate the light, who want nothing to do with God, how is it even possible well, Jesus tells us why he can. It's because of what God did. 
what the Father did in sending his Son into the world to die on the cross. Now let's consider under this point, first of all, that if you're trusting Jesus Christ this morning, and, and this is something that should be a great blessing and comfort to all of us who have, that God loved you so much that he gave you his Son. And that's as we see in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son the one who was most precious to him. Now, if you're a parent here this morning, and particularly if you're a Christian parent, you know that the most precious thing in the world to you, aside from your Lord, you know, uh, you are to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that applies to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you can only do that because of his grace. And, of course, uh, aside from your spouse, whom you have committed to love second most uh, to the one whom you love most. Uh, the one you love the most or those you love most outside of these are your children. You know, the same thing is true for God, isn't it? He tells us that there is nothing that he loves more than his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now understand, by God, John clearly here is referring to the Father. It was the Father who gave you His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus is God's Son in at least two senses. He is the eternal Son of God with regard to His deity. And He is the, uh, the Son of God with regard to His humanity who was begotten in time. Remember that He is the Father's eternally begotten Son with regard to His deity. The Son of God from all eternity. He's the one who became man in time. Now again, by eternally begotten, we mean that he has always existed and he has always existed as the Son of the Father. Now do we understand that fully? No. Uh, any more than we understand anything fully about God, but we do know it's true. Jesus was a son before he came into the world before he was begotten in the womb of the virgin. Paul writes in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. I just want to simply say Jesus did not become a son when he came into the world. He was already the Son. Uh, when he came. But Jesus is also God's son in a second sense, in that he was begotten in time as to his humanity. Remember what Gabriel said to Mary in Luke 1.35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. He's going to be called the Son of God because he literally is, as to his humanity, the Son of God. Jesus doesn't have an earthly father. He has a divine father. His human nature has a divine father as well as his divine nature. Jesus is God's Son. Now again, the point is he is a son in both senses, which is why the Father loves him so much. Remember when Jesus was baptized, the Father declares out of heaven in Matthew 3.17, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The word beloved here means more than he just merely loved him like he would love anyone else that may belong to him. It refers to a unique and special love. Jesus is his only love, his only beloved and well-pleased here means that Jesus is the one the Father takes delight and pleasure in. Now, why does the Father love Jesus so much? Is it simply because he is his son? Well, yes and no. It's being his son means something in particular. Being his son means that he bears his image. By the way, have you ever asked yourself why you love your children? <laughs> now, we, we love our children because we're committed to them, right? Right? And because we have to, God commands us to. <laughs> Sometimes they're not so lovable. But there are things in them that do draw our hearts out to them. And oddly enough, or maybe not so oddly, it, it's because they bear our image. When we look at them, we can see ourselves in them. 
we see perhaps the best of ourselves and we see maybe the worst of ourselves, but we do see ourselves in them and that makes us have some kind of, of love, some measure of love for them. Well, you realize that that's the reason why God the Father loves His Son is because His Son bears His image. Paul writes in Colossians 1.15, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1.3 that He, Jesus, is the radiance of His glory, that is, of, of the Father's glory, and the exact representation of His nature. There's nothing that God loves more than His own image. And that may sound vain, but on God's part, it isn't vain. It would be vain for us to look at our image in the mirror and say, Oh, I love you. I think there was a, um, a, Greek, a Greek person that had that problem, his name escapes me right now, but he, he would sit there and he would look in, in the, uh, the ref his reflection in, in the pond and, it, it, oh yes, right, Narcissus, and he would admire himself. We call that being narcissistic, right? But it isn't on the part of God because God really is lovely and there is nothing more beautiful than him. And so when he reflects upon his image, he can love it and not be vain because there is nothing more beautiful or perfect than him, but that's exactly what Jesus is and why he loves him. But again, getting back to our main point, how great is God's love for you this morning if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? His love was so great that he was willing to give this one whom he loved most of all for your salvation. Now, lest we misunderstand that, does that mean God loves you more than he loves his son? Does that mean he sees more beauty in you than he sees in his son? Does that mean that you are worthy of such a great gift as this? No, it doesn't at all. You are not worthy. I am not worthy of this gift. We are worthy only of damnation. We're actually going to see that in just a moment as well, which makes this love appear even more greatly. But God's love was so great that in spite of what we were, he was willing to give us that which was most precious to him in order to save us. Now again, God's love is seen in the greatness of the gift or the one that he gives to us to save us, but it becomes clearer when you also see what he gave his son to do for us, and that is to die on the cross. That's what Jesus is referring to in verses 14 and 15 of John chapter 3, where he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Now you know the Old Testament is filled with pictures of Jesus. The whole Old Testament is about him, as well as the New Testament. It's not just, you know, he appears here and there. He appears in so many different ways because that's how people were saved in the Old Testament. God would show them a picture, and if they saw Jesus and believed in him, they would be saved. Now, those pictures came in a variety of forms. They came in the form of prophecies, such as that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That was referring to Jesus' work on the cross when he destroyed the work of Satan and freed us from our sins. It comes in the form of promises. When Abraham was going to offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, as he lifted up the knife and the angel told him to stop, and he showed him the ram that he would sacrifice in said. Abraham knew that God was going to provide on that mount uh, one who would be the sacrificial lamb that would take away the sins of the world. That was a promise, a prophecy you might say, but also a promise. Uh, the Lord showed the Lord, uh, should say the Father revealed, actually it was Jesus revealing himself to the Old Testament institutions, to so the, the uh, tabernacle and the temple and the priesthood and all the sacrifices that were going on in there were all grand pictures of what Jesus was going to do to save us. But there were also events that pictured the Lord Jesus Christ, such as that of the serpent Moses lifted up in the wilderness. Let me give you a little bit of the context of that picture really quickly. The Jews were wandering around in the wilderness of Sinai for 40 years because they had sinned against God. They didn't trust that God could bring them into the promised land, so he sentenced them to wander in the wilderness until that whole generation died off, and yet he still preserved them for 40 years and took care of them. But while they were in the wilderness, they began to complain. 
about the way that the Lord was taking care of them. They didn't like his provision. They didn't like manna, the uh, food of angels. And so they began to complain. We read in Numbers 21, verses 5 through 9. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. That's the manna. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Now Jesus tells us that that was a picture of his work and how he would save the world. Uh, the people had sinned against God in the wilderness and God had brought this judgment down on them in the form of these fiery serpents. All they basically did was complain about the cuisine. We don't like the food you provided for us, God. You're not doing well enough. Why did God get so angry? You know, sometimes things we consider to be relatively small are much larger in God's eyes than we might think because we need to remember that even the smallest sins that we commit against God deserve damnation. Whenever we complain, we're complaining against God. Whenever we sin, we're sinning against God, and God is infinitely holy. He does distinguish between great sins and small sins, but there is no sin that we can commit that doesn't deserve damnation because God is infinitely holy. So we should never think there is such a thing as a small sin. We need to get rid of those just as much as greater sins. But they complained against God, and God brought this judgment on them. But when they cried out for mercy, God showed them mercy. He told Moses to make an image of one of those serpents and to lift it up on a pole with the promise that everyone who believed what God said regarding that serpent when they had been bitten, if they looked to that serpent because they believed the promise of God, they would be saved. Now, we didn't even cry out for mercy, did we? We weren't even aware of the situation that we were in, except perhaps through our conscience. We knew that we had sinned against God, and we knew that we deserved judgment. But the Lord sent His Son and showed mercy upon us anyway. He sent His Son into the world and lifted Him up on the cross in order to take judgment, our judgment, in His place. Now, in this case, Jesus, you know, is... Uh, the serpents were actually God's act of judgment and the serpent was put on the pole and if they looked to that, they would be saved. In this case, Jesus takes on himself our nature and he's lifted up on a cross so that we will only look to him. If we will only believe the promise that God has made, that all who trust in him would be saved, we will be delivered. We would be saved. So God loved you so much that he sent the one whom he loved most of all into the world, but he sent him into the world to die for you. And again, let me just remind you that what Jesus endured was not just the physical pain. You know, we always hear these, uh, well, when, when we think about the cross, we often hear it explained in terms of the physical pain he was going through. And I'm sure it hurt a lot. But there were a couple of other thieves that were crucified along with him, and they suffered exactly the same thing. And yet, we don't read before the, the, the day or the night before their crucifixion that they're sweating blood. But we do see Jesus sweating blood. Why was he sweating blood? Was it because he didn't have the stomach for this kind of thing? And the others could endure it much more easily? No. It's because of what Jesus would actually endure on the cross, which was much more than just wounds in his hands, a wound in his head and the beating on his back and so forth. I'm, I'm sure that was excruciating. But it was because, as we saw in the Second Corinthians passage is because the Father laid our sins upon Him. And Jesus suffered the wrath of God on the cross for our sins. That's why it became dark, so that we wouldn't see it so clearly. 
that agony and that suffering when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only reason why the Father would do that is because Jesus was bearing our sins and had become a curse in our place and suffering God's wrath in our place. And yet we're reminded also, again, if I may mention Jonathan Edwards, Jesus knew the hand that was striking him was not striking him for his sins, but for the sins that his people had committed and that that hand that was striking him loved him and that he was doing this for his Father's glory and he was doing it out of love for you who would put your trust in him. That's how great God's love is for you. Now thirdly, God loved the world so much that he was willing to do this for us. You know, God's love is demonstrated by the worth of the gift. It's his only beloved son. It's demonstrated by what he gave his son to do, to suffer his wrath on the cross for you. But it's also demonstrated by who it is that the Lord actually gives his life for. Again in verse 16 of John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now again, we do have to not divorce this verse from what actually precedes it. And that has to do, of course, with the work that Jesus was telling Nicodemus about, the work of the Spirit of God and this necessity of the second birth. Uh, the question that we're asking here is, what does God mean? What does Jesus mean? He's actually the one who says this. Sometimes we forget Jesus is the one who actually uttered these words. What is he saying here when he says, God so loved the world? Well, he isn't saying here what most people think he is saying that Jesus came to lay down his life or to die for each and every individual who has ever lived. And as hard as it may be for some of us to hear this, we do need to understand that that is in fact what the Bible teaches. Sometimes we don't consider that when Jesus came into the world to lay down his life, there were many who were already suffering in hell. Now, we may disagree on how many thousands of years actually took place before Jesus came into the world, right? Maybe 4,000, 6,000, 10,000, some say much longer than that. But we do know this, a lot of people lived and a lot of people died who never heard the gospel. Because when you look at, at the Old Testament, you see that God kept that truth in a very narrow family line. Uh, beginning from just one of the uh, sons of, of Adam uh, to just one of the sons of Noah and then through Abraham and just through his offspring but not all of his offspring, not Ishmael and not through you know, both sons of, of uh, Isaac and so forth. God kept that truth in a very narrow line. There were a lot of people who lived and died who never heard the gospel. Jesus didn't die on the cross for those who were already in hell and I'm going to show you why in just a moment. There were many who were living in Jesus' day, who were living far away in other nations that would never hear the gospel because it would be many centuries before the gospel would ever reach them. Did Jesus die for them as well when they were going to have no opportunity to hear the gospel? And do you realize that from the days of Jesus Christ and even in the Old Testament where the truth of God was, was among the Jews, there would be many who would hear it and would see it in all these pictures, prophecies, and promises. Many would hear it in Jesus' day. Uh, many would hear it as it's preached throughout the, uh, the Roman Empire. Many would hear it throughout the centuries as it's relayed from person to person who would never believe it and would never receive it. Did Jesus die for them? Actually, the Bible says that he didn't. He didn't even die to give them the opportunity, as it were, at salvation. I mean, yes, there is an opportunity. Well, yes, he did die to give them an opportunity because the gospel is to be presented to all men. But one thing we need to see from Scripture is it's quite clear that when Jesus died, when he laid down his life, he died for a specific group of people, his people, his sheep. Now let me draw your attention to Matthew 1 verse 21 where Gabriel says to Joseph regarding what's going on here with Mary. He says this, she will bear a son. 
and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I want you to notice that Gabriel does not say here that Jesus was going to save all men from their sins, but he was going to save his people. By the way, why is his name Jesus? It's for this very reason, because he's a savior. The name Jesus simply means Jehovah, that is the covenant God of Israel, is salvation. He is the savior. That's why his name is called Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, who are these people? Uh, Jesus tells us in John 10, 11, that they are his sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now notice Jesus doesn't say he lays down his life for everyone, but he lays them down for a specific group, and they are known as his sheep. Now we might say, okay, well, the world is a sheep. He lays down his life for the entire world, and we might perhaps come to that conclusion if we didn't have many other passages that tell us otherwise. But also in John chapter 10, verses 24 through 28, where Jesus clearly talks to those who were rejecting him, and tells them that the reason why they don't believe in him is because they are not his sheep. Now, he doesn't say, you're not my sheep because you don't believe, but he says, you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. If that doesn't make sense to you, talk to me afterwards because that's a very important distinction. But this is what he says in John 10, 24 through 28. The Jews had gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I would just draw your attention again to what Paul told us in the beginning in our uh, meditation, that Jesus died in order to make a people righteous. He didn't die, uh, as it were, offer a sacrifice to potentially make everybody in the world righteous, but he died to make those for whom he was dying absolutely righteous. Not potentially, but really. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now again, uh, if Jesus had laid down his life for all, if he had made, according to this passage, if he had done that, he would have made everyone righteous. And then everyone would have been saved. But that is clearly, I, I mean, we know that that isn't the case. We see that all around us. But the Bible is also quite plain. Not everyone is going to be saved. John writes in Revelation 20, verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And by the way, we do see that there are those who are thrown into the lake of fire uh, and who suffer forever and ever. We don't rejoice in that. And the fact that, you know, that, that people are suffering in hell, we don't rejoice in that. I mean, we could very well have been there ourselves because we deserve to be there just like they do. But God had mercy, sent his son, and made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I hope you can understand what that passage says. You know, when I was in seminary, and again, a uh, particular seminary I went to was Westminster Seminary, that uh, John Frame was beginning one of his classes and he was explaining to us uh, the absolute sovereignty of God, uh, which is what we believe. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over the molecules of air. In the, in, you know, in the atmosphere and where they are at every moment. He's sovereign over little things and he's sovereign over great things, even over our souls, you see. Well, a hand went up in the front row and <laughs> there was a student there who said, well, professor, I don't agree with that. I think that, that we make our own choice and uh, 
John Frame just kind of looked around like this and he goes, uh, how did you get in here? <laughs> uh, we thought that was kind of humorous because it was a seminary that believed in the sovereignty of God and how did he get there? Well, this was the passage that John Frame took him to. This passage that we just read in Paul, 2 Corinthians 5.21, you need to come to grips with what this says. What was it that God was actually doing in Christ when he sent him into the world and for whom was Jesus doing this work? He was doing it for his sheep, for his people. He shall be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then he says to those Pharisees, you are not of my sheep. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they listen to me and they follow me. You're not doing that, you see. You're not of my sheep, what Jesus says. But he lays down his life for the sheep. So the Father did not really send his Son into the world for everyone who would ever live. That's not what he means here by the word world. And again, we do have to understand in Scripture the word world is used in a variety of ways. There's one point at which the high priest says to his compatriots, look, you're not doing any good. Don't you see that? The whole world has gone after him. And yet it's clear that he meant by that the majority of Israel and not each and every individual in the world. The word world can mean a variety of things in different contexts. So what does he mean here by the word world? Well, I think he means two things. First of all, that God's love in redemption is not just for the Jews. It's also for Gentiles. He's extending it to the entire world, as it were. Not just for the physical children of Abraham. In other words... He's extended it to us who are not physically the children of Abraham but can become spiritually the children of Abraham by trusting in him. But I think he also means this, and this is where we see the love of God again revealed to us. Not only that he went outside the Jews, but what our condition was when he actually did this for us. He was willing to send his son to die for us even when we were in the condition that we were in. When we were under the sentence of death. I mean, look at what Jesus says in John 3, verse 17. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The world needed to be saved because the world was in darkness, the world was in sin, right? Right? And he, Jesus didn't have to come into the world to condemn us. We were already condemned. We were already under the sentence of death for our own sins. He came to save us from our sins. And again, I think this is perhaps the main point of what Jesus is saying in John 3.16, that God's love is so great that he would be willing to give that which was most precious to him to die an excruciating death on the cross as he suffered God's wrath for those who are not his friends but for those who were his enemies. That's what Paul draws our attention to in Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now remember that when Paul writes these letters, when, when any of the authors write any of their letters, they're not writing them to the world. Uh, this is not addressed to the world. This is addressed to the church at Rome. God demonstrates his own love toward us, Paul is saying, towards me and towards you, professing Christians in Rome, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's not saying the whole world, but for those of you who have trusted. So why is there such a thing as a new birth? Why is the Spirit of God breathing life into whom he wills when and where he wills? Why is that even possible? It's because God so loved the world that he sent that which is most precious to him to die on the cross while they were yet his enemies. That's what he did for you. That's why there is salvation. That's why you're saved if you're trusting Jesus Christ. That's why the possibility of salvation even exists. But now, of course, we put it in this light and we say, well, this is something that God is doing and not a choice that we're making, but the ball is in his court. He's the one who sovereignly sends his spirit to breathe life where he wills, then it raises another question. And that is, how can you know that God has loved you and sent his son for you? How do you know you're one of those people, one of those sheep? Well, as Jesus told Nicodemus, the only way that you can see the kingdom and enter the kingdom is through the new birth. You have to be born again. But how can you know 
whether or not you've been born again by the Spirit of God? Well, you can if you believe in Jesus Christ. Again, our text in John 3, verses 14 through 16. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, we, like I said, we, we often divorce that passage from everything that Jesus said to Nicodemus, but do you realize that that's the same conversation? You know, we might divide these things up into verses and chapters, but sometimes those divisions are in the wrong place. And we need to realize that each verse is not stand alone. It has a context. This is in the context of Jesus speaking, speaking to Nicodemus. And Jesus has just told Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom and you can't enter it apart from this second birth. Believing is, is not how you receive the second birth because Jesus just told Nicodemus that the second birth is a sovereign work of the Spirit of God. It's like the wind. It blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, but you can see its effects. Believing is not how you receive the second birth. Believing is the evidence that you have received the second birth. If you can't see the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again of the Spirit and you realize that you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's clear that faith is the result of that new birth. When the Spirit of God breathes life into you, He, he raises you from the dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, Paul said, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and you were the sons of disobedience and children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, in his mercy, when you were dead, made you alive. That's that work of the Spirit of God, raising you to spiritual life. And that is what is necessary before you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Faith is the evidence of the new birth. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ, if you believe on him and you're turning from your sins, you have been born again because you cannot do that on your own. If you're in darkness, you hate the light and don't come to the light. The Lord has to turn the light on and make you light before you're going to come. And that's what he does by his Holy Spirit. So in closing, let me ask you the simple question. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting Him to get you into heaven? Is He your only hope of acceptance with God? And you're not relying on anything else, not your own works, not anything you've done, but on Jesus Christ alone. Well, if that's the case with you, even if you thought that was something you did, a decision you made, you need to understand that's something God did. If you're trusting Jesus Christ, you've experienced the new birth. And if you've experienced a new birth, you can know that God loves you and sent his son to die for you even while you were his enemy. You didn't become his friend and then he saved you. He saved you while you were still his enemy. He changed your heart. You need to give him the glory for that, the credit for that. Make sure you acknowledge that and thank him for that because that is a gift of infinite value. But if you don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you really can't know that you fall into this category unless and until you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what should you do? Well, I already told you the Spirit of God does His work sovereignly where He wills and He breathes life into whom He wills, but He generally does it. There are exceptions, but generally under the preaching of the gospel. That's why... People respond to the gospel. It's not because they could do it. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. There was none who seeks after God, Paul tells us. They did it only because the Spirit of God gave them that ability. If, if he's given you that ability, then trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from your sins and be saved and you can know God sent his Son to die for you. But if you can't do that, then I would counsel you to ask him for this mercy for this grace. You know, the, the pastors of old who understood this and believed this, 
would run into people like this all the time because they would, they would show them from Scripture what it is that a Christian is. And when you see what a Christian is, one who loves the Lord and submits to Him and reads His Word and does it because He loves Him, they realized they weren't saved. And they realized they couldn't change their hearts either. And so what did those pastors tell them to do? They said, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him for mercy because God is merciful and He is gracious. Ask Him for the grace to change your life. And keep asking until He does. You know, there's so much more that needs to be said about saving faith because I think, you know, we, we use that word a lot. We use the word faith and we all think we understand what we mean by that, but we do need to understand it is a little bit more than just believing the facts. Can you think of anyone who believes the facts about Christianity but who isn't saved? The devil, does he believe the facts? Do the demons believe those facts? Do the people who are suffering in hell right now, do they believe those facts? Are there any there who believe? It's much more than believing the facts, isn't it? We've seen that it's a change of life. This faith that's being referred to here is the result of the new birth of the Holy Spirit that changes the whole direction of your life. Now, I've just opened a huge topic, and I'm not going to elaborate on that this morning. So we're going to leave that for this evening. What is this faith that actually saves? And I would encourage you to return and to examine your own faith in light of what the Bible says will be true of saving faith. But for now, let's, let's simply bow and, and pray, and let's ask the Lord to show us where we stand with Him, whether we have actually believed or whether we still need that new birth and then let's ask the Lord for the grace that we need to respond accordingly. Let's pray.